There is no I as such. There is no pure I. Of course, we use the word I all the time. So he's not telling us there is no I in language. Obviously, there's an I in language. But he wants to say on the level of concept that he's trying to teach us here, the, the I doesn't exist in isolation except in an abstract grammatical sense. In grammar, yes, you can write I and just that's it. Relation. It exists only in relation. So that's what he's saying, Unless yeah, that you exactly, exist exactly, only in, only in relation, exactly. So he says that's why it does not exist as such, but only the I of the basic word I, you, and the I of the basic word I, it. The I always has some type of relationship and has a choice between one of the two. A choice, choice is not the right word, but it's, there, there are two possibilities. When a man says I, mensch, you're right, when a human being says I, he means one or the other. The I, he means, is present when he says I. And when he says you or it, the I of the one or the other basic word is also present. So the, I, the kind of I you say depends on whether you're saying I or you. Being I and saying I are the same thing. Being I, right? So when you say I for him, it's not just speech, it's your whole being. As he said, you say I with your whole being. Saying I and saying one of the two basic words are the same thing. Whoever speaks one of the basic words enters into the word and stands in it. What Buber effectively does it is he takes our, our grammatical triangle of I, you, and it, and he basically collapses it. Even though grammatically, again, of course, the three are still there, but Buber wants to tell, uh, like he says at the beginning, the world is twofold. So he wants to say, I want you to start thinking of, of the grammar, the deep grammar, maybe well, that's what we can call it, the deep grammar of the world, in terms of two basic pronouns, you and it, where each I is a function, as it were, of either the you or the it. And here I want to bring in a text um, from the man we saw earlier, from Eugen Rosenstock Hussey, who had an influence, as I mentioned, on, on Franz Rosenzweig. This is from his book, which is a very peculiar title in German. He did. He gave it a, a, on purpose. He gave it a weird, a weird, a weirdly German title. And he didn't call it. He didn't say Psychologie, but Seelenkunde. You know, soul knowledge and angewandte Seelenkunde, applied. Which you could translate as applied psychology. This is a book he wrote and he sent specifically to Franz Rosenzweig on the when Franz Rosenzweig was on the on the in the trenches of the First World War. So it was almost like a personal book written personally for him. It had a big impact on Rosenzweig. Um, so in this fifth chapter book, where he talks about the grammar of the soul, that's the name of the chapter, he says as following, academic psychologists claim that the I is the soul absolute. The you, the he, the she, the it of things is noteworthy only when it is taken up by this grammatical first person, by this I within the soul. The I classifies non-I's, or its brothers, or God, or other objects. This view corresponds to the assertion of the Greek grammarians that the I is the first person of the verb. So we can see that it originated from an antiquated standpoint of thinking. Nowadays, Greek philosophy and Greek academic grammar are no longer the valid basis for such far-reaching assertions. The I may still be called the first person in our textbooks. A grammar may still say, yeah, I is first person. But psychologists may no longer naively accept this incorrect enumeration as dogma. We shouldn't allow grammar to influence the way we do psychology, he says. He goes on to give us a nice example. Out of a thousand cares, impressions, and influences that surround, flow around, and beset us, a child gradually stakes out its borders as an independent entity. Its first discovery of its own, therefore, is that it is neither world nor mother, nor father, nor God, but something else. The first thing that happens to a child, to every person, is that it is spoken to. It is smiled at, entreated, rocked, comforted, punished, given presents, or is nourished. It is first a you to a powerful being outside itself, above all to its parents. For this reason, Goethe was correct when he wrote in Pandora, a father is always a god. He is so because he is present for his daughter. I like he's very f feminist here, right? Let's say something like that. He's present for his daughter before her own eye is, and because he bestows upon her the consciousness of herself by addressing her as a you. 
So what is he saying here? You know, children often will speak of themselves actually in the third person, right? Does Susie want an ice cream? Yeah, yeah, Susie wants an ice cream. You know, she talks about herself in the third person, right? So, but he's saying here, on a deeper level, it's even deeper. It's actually not third person, but second. The first, the, the, in our earliest formation of our psyche, we are, know ourselves as you. We're always being addressed as you. We never think, oh, I'm I. We don't have any awareness of ourselves as, right? He goes on to say in this chapter that it's only when the child starts to mature beyond the earliest stages and it feels a need to impose its will against the parent. And the first most important imposition, the first, first great discovery, linguistic discovery of a child, he says, is the word no. No. When the child says, no, eh, no, right? He says, as soon as the child says no, that's the word that puts the child on the path to the word I. There is no I before no, right? Because when the child says no, and the child realizes, oh, it works. My mother is frustrated. You know, she might be angry, she might, she might make her laugh, whatever, but she, it's like, wow, I use the word no, and I see the parent goes, oh, right? Whereas until then, the, the, the first you is a good, right? You say the father is a god, right? The mother is a goddess, the father is a god, the whole world is filled by the mother and the father. And suddenly the child says no, and sees the father, the God, is recoiling. The child goes, wow, I said no. I want now. I want this and that, right? So we discover our I. We don't, it takes a while. It takes effort on the part of the child to discover the I. Right? We're first, we are first a you. This is not, of course, what Buber is saying, because Buber is not talking about the I as a you. But it's related. It's related, right? Here he's, uh, here, um, Rosenstock, who see, is telling us that, uh, that the word you, in a sense, is primary in, lang in language itself. On a deep conceptual level, the word is, you more, is more primary than, than the I. The life of a human being does not exist merely in the sphere of goal-directed verbs. It does not consist merely of activities that have something for their object. I perceive something. I feel something, I imagine something, I want something, I sense something, I think something. The life of the human being does not consist merely in all this and its like. All this and its like is the basis of the realm of the it. When I have a verb at stake, I will have some type of it. But the realm of the you has another basis. In other words, the realm of you really doesn't have a verb. Right? There's no real verb. There might be a verb happening there, but the verb is not as important as it is when the I is related to the it. Now, to bring in the philosophical development of this, which was very, had a huge impact on the way that philosophy was done since the 16th century by René Descartes, whom you might know at least for mathematics if you studied math, usually in grade 11 you learned about the Cartesian system. And even if you don't know about René Descartes, I'm sure you've heard the famous phrase, je pense donc je suis, I think, therefore I am. Right? That's the, that statement is the foundation of modern thought. Why? Because Descartes was the thinker who wanted to break with the tradition of medieval thought and with all the assumptions that had been given to him in medieval, by medieval thinking. And he said, I want to have a new basis for thought, a new basis for, for philosophy. What can I know? What is it possible to know if I assume that I... Every, the, he said, let's assume the world is a complete illusion. I don't know anything. He said, you know what? But even then, even if it's a complete illusion, I think that it's a complete illusion. And if I think, I must be. So I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum. And by saying that statement, Descartes basically establishes the I of the cogito, or the I, the je in French. He wrote the book originally in French and then translated into, Sp into Latin, back into Latin. The je becomes instrumental, the, becomes the focus point of how to begin thinking. The, the, the axial, the, uh, the axis, sorry, the axis point around which truth revolves is this I. Yes, Samuel. Uh, I was just uh, I, I actually been thinking about Descartes while we've been going through this, because it, it seems uh, hard to reconcile uh, uh, not Boober so much. I, with Boober, I think you could just say that I, it can't be doubted, but I, you can, according to meditation on first philosophy. 
right? Because we don't know that the uh, the U exists, but we know that absolutely for sure. I U, yeah, yeah. But we I, know I it does insofar as uh, if we have perceptions of the outside, they may be false, but they are perceptions that are Good. there to be an it. Good. Okay, so you could say that. That's an interesting point. Yeah, but uh, the. the I don't see how you could uh, reconcile the. I'm sorry, I forgot his name. The, the Buber? No, the thinker oh. that uh, Rosenstock was. Re oh, yeah, yeah Rosenstock Hussey. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, I don't see how you could reconcile that with uh, the basis of Cartesian thought. You can't. You absolutely cannot. Rosenstock Hussey is, is criticizing Descartes. He's, he's explicitly, well, implicitly, he doesn't mention Descartes in that section here. But the, the whole of modern philosophy, you know, what's called so modern philosophy has its beginning with the meditations of Descartes. That's the, that's the first thing. You might say Francis Bacon also, but really Descartes' meditations and his, and his method on discourse, the uh, discourse de la méthode, the uh, method on discourse is the beginning of modern thought, modern philosophy, I should say, modern European philosophy. So that, that philosophy is guided by the primacy of the I, by saying I is primary. And Rosenstock Husey and Buber and many others like him say, well, that's, you know, very nice, but we disagree. That's, that's very nice theoretically. It's a nice theoretical experiment in which, in which you, you began with, it with the epistemological problem, how to prove reality, how to prove this and that. And so the problem of epistemology, of tr proving what is true, forced you to retreat back into yourself you know, like, like, a, like an army that says, oh my gosh, we can't win this war. Okay, retreat, retreat, go back. It's what we know. Well, what do we know? What do we know? We know that we exist. I, I, I must exist. So these things are saying, well, why are, you, why are you so anxious? Why are you so... I mean, yeah, in that thought experiment, okay, all you have is I, but that's not how things really work. A baby doesn't have I. It takes a, lo a long time for a baby to come to the term I. A, math a mathematician comes to the word I by, through thought experiments, but it's not really how reality exists. And you, you very nicely put it, you know, Descartes just says, I think, therefore I am. What do you think, Monsieur Descartes? Rien. I, he doesn't say what he thinks about. I'm not thinking about anything. So you might be tempted to say, well, there is no it either. It's just I, without an it. But Sam, I agree with you that he's saying that if I think, there's some type, something even completely illusory there that I'm thinking, and therefore that thought is already it. I may not say the word it, but it, but it does imply that there is an it there. So when Descartes says I, he means I it in Buber's, in Buber's uh, lingo. If we were to translate the Cartesian I into Buber's lingo. Now this, this as I say, just to point out, uh, uh, I want to mention two other very important thinkers who, who took this idea even further. The first great one is the Immanuel Kant, who, building on Descartes' idea, says, I think, ich denke now in German, must be able to accompany all of my representations, which is getting closer to what you're saying, Sam, that because the representations are really the it. By what Vorstellung in it. Kant is just analyzing what it means to have consciousness. What is consciousness? Consciousness means I'm aware of things. So Kant says, whenever there's something there that I'm aware of, there's an I that is implicitly there, which he calls the transcendental ego, whatever, the transcendental I, which, which simply means that the I is, is may not be said explicitly. It may not even be thought explicitly. The I is not thematized. It's not made into a theme by consciousness. Consciousness is merely conscious of things. And yet, for there to be a consciousness of things, the I must be presupposed as logically necessary to that consciousness. And that's, why he, that's, what the, that's the word transcendental means in that context. It just means presupposed. It's a, pre, it's a logical, logically presupposed as an a priori, he would say, by, by consciousness. This idea is then developed further and in a slightly different direction by a very influential thinker of the early 20th century named Edmund Husserl, who was Jewish, um, by birth at least, who developed a whole philosophical 
mode of well, whole philosophical school actually, which is known as phenomenology. Big, big word, phenomenology. Uh, and all of the modern, pretty much all of the modern European thinkers were deeply influenced by this phenomenological way of thinking. At the heart of phenomenology stands a concept which he calls intentionality. Um, I gi I'm giving a quote here from the man who influenced him, uh, Husserl, namely Franz Ber uh, Brentano, uh, who was a Christian thinker, psychologist. He was a he was a priest, I believe, but uh, he was um, he wrote uh, also at that time a very influential book on psychology, proto psychology, not psychology as we know it since Freud, but before that. In fact, I believe that Freud was one of the students sitting in his class in Vienna when he gave his lectures on psychology, psychology from an empirical standpoint, an empirical standpoint. And there he says, he, he defines intentionality as follows. He says, every mental phenomenon, every thought, every feeling, every intuition, everything that happens in consciousness is characterized by what the scholastics, in other words, the medieval thinkers, called the intentional or mental inexistence. Inexistence here doesn't mean it doesn't exist, it means that it exists only in the mind. Of the inexistence of an object and what we might call, though not wholly unambiguously, reference to a content, what we might call a direction towards an object. Consciousness is directed towards an object. When we are conscious, we are conscious of something. It's very difficult to be conscious of nothing. Uh, Buddhists spend a lot of effort in meditation removing all possible objects from consciousness. Very few people attain it. And even when they attain it, it's generally fleeting. It doesn't last for very long. You can, you can achieve what, what the Buddhists call empty mind. Empty mind means mind without empty of consciousness, empty of, of objects, em empty of something that is intended. That's what this word intentionality means. I, I intended, I, my intention, not that I, not intention in the more simple sense of I wish to do that, I intend to do that, but intention in, in the sense that it is the object of my thinking. I think, I see a cup, I have a thought, I have a desire, I have a wish, I have a feeling. Whatever, whatever is happening in consciousness, there's a direction towards some type of object. All of this is a development of the Cartesian way of looking at reality, which puts the I at the center, and then the I intends, the, from my, all, reality is, is structured as, uh, as, uh, as what, what I go out towards or what comes into me from the objective world. And it's, but it's always me at the center. And, and, then, uh, and then, of course, for Husserl becomes a huge problem uh, since Descartes, in fact, there was a huge problem. How do I know that you people exist? I mean, I know I exist, but how do I know you're not all robots? Right? Descartes has said that. He says in his meditations, he, see, he, see, he says, I see somebody walking outside my window, but how do I know he's not a robot? He even says, automaton is the word he uses. At that time, people were developing new, um, if you've seen this, the beautiful movie Hugo. See this movie Hugo? So you know in there there's an automaton made out of a beautiful silver or gold, a kind of little robot, a proto-robot. And that was a big, it made a big splash in the French scene back then. So, so Descartes says, how do I know that these aren't just robots or just figments of my imagination? Maybe you're all just, you know, I did too much LSD today and, and now I see people. But they're not, you're not really, really out there, right? It's all in my head, man. It's like the Matrix. It's all in my head. Right, so, so these philosophers, ever since Descartes, they are always busy with the problem, what it's even officially called, the problem of the external world. Which means, how do I know you guys exist? That's what the problem is, right? Uh, and Husserl was very concerned with it. How do I know that others exist? And he tried to prove, philosophically, that others exist. Now, of course, for Buber, as for Rosenzweig, uh, Rosenstock, Hussey, and so on, the whole problem is ridiculous. You know, because it's ridiculous, not because it's unintelligent, it's, it could be brilliant, it could be complex or whatever, but it's ridiculous because the standpoint that you're starting from, the I, that's not, 
reality. That's not how reality really is. Reality is always, yes, it is either an, uh, an, I, an I standing in relation to an it, or for Buber, an I standing in relation to a thou. There is no solitary I, the, the I of pure consciousness, right? Or the consciousness of the pure I. That, that for, for the, these thinkers like Buber, is a, is a philosophical uh, abstraction which they want to move away from. Having said that, you might appreciate how radical Buber's statement is now, page 55. He says, whoever says you does not have something for his object. For wherever there is something, there's also another something. Every it borders on other its. It is only by virtue of bordering on others. But where you have said, there is no something, you has no borders, Whoever says you does not have something, he has nothing, but he stands in relation. Like you said before, right? I perceive something, I feel something, I imagine something, I want something, I sense something, I think something, right? There's always something there as part of my intention. So, he, so Buber says, when we're talking about you, there's nothing there. There's, not, there's no intentionality, there's nothing. There, not that there's nothing in the sense of I'm, I'm, I'm passed out and there's no consciousness. I'm not, I didn't pass out, I'm still awake. But the relationship is so intense that there's nothing there. There's only you, that's it. Well, is you something? It's not really appropriate to call it something. You is not a thing, a thing. So it's not, it's not something, it's much more intimate than something.